Hi, everybody. This is Paul Bryan of UX Strat. Today, I'm talking with Amanda Rosenberg, who is product lead and senior researcher at Google. Hi, Amanda. Welcome to the Stratosphere. Hi, thank you for having me. Sure. Well, um, I do want to talk to you today about a specific topic. But before we get into it, can you tell me a little bit about your role at Google and what are the steps that led up to it? Sure. Um, so I am a senior researcher, as you mentioned, at Google, and I've been on the education team, Google for Education, for three years now. I started off as one of the leads on Google Assignments, which is launching this fall from um, start to finish. So it was really exciting to be on a product from conception to birth. Um, from there, I worked on our Google Originality Analysis tool. And then I moved on to the Google Classroom, which now serves over 100 million students worldwide. And how I, how I got to Google is actually, I feel like, a common story for many researchers is that we started off in, well, I started off in academic research. Um, I have a master's in developmental psychology from Columbia, and then I moved into doctoral work at Columbia as well in instructional technology and media and spent most of my foundation learning how to do academic uh, research through rigor and validation and uh, dedicating a lot of time and learning how to replicate studies um, to be able to cross uh, compare findings and build on top of the research that um, I had been doing. And after my, my life in academia, I ended up moving into market research, and then I moved into uh, usability UXR. Okay. Well, the reason I reached out um, is there's been some talk recently on LinkedIn and different uh, message boards about the democratization of user research. And I guess what I think they mean by that is um, having non-researchers do research to help um, products uh, succeed. Um, and so before we get into it any further, is, um, uh, can you comment on that overall topic? Yeah. Um, so for me, I had made a post on LinkedIn not too long ago after I had seen Molly Stevens, who's a brilliant UXR, um, who is at, now at booking.com, her talk at UXR conference anywhere where she spoke about the importance of keeping our, our discipline um, at, at a level that um, we deserve to be at in terms of acknowledging um, our, our expertise, right? And how when we give a lot of other people um, responsibilities and research, we're, we're devaluing what we do. And it made me sit and think about how much it resonated. Um, it's something that I, I think of constantly, especially in my field and where I work and, and how research impacts um, so many people. Um, so that's, that's where um, it kind of started. And um, it kind of, it, it really picked up some steam and it's, uh, really started some interesting conversation, especially on LinkedIn. Sure. Well, I know that um, obviously Google hires the top um, people in your field and design field and the engineering field. And, um, you know, some years ago, designers were faced with people throughout the team doing design work. Um, and now researchers are faced with people throughout the team doing research. I mean, anybody can design to some extent. Anybody can research to some extent. So where do you draw the line between what a professional researcher and an educated researcher like yourself um, is doing on the team versus what any member of the team is doing just to discover more about the product? Yeah, I think there's always room for um, people to talk to people, right? Designers to talk to users. It doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's research. Um, I I think where we draw the line is, or where I draw the line is where um, research begins to have more scope and breadth, right? So if I'm looking at one area and having to make sure that what the data we're collecting for foundational research and in this one topic can actually be cross compared to a different topic on a different product, 
um, is very different than a designer testing a set of mocks or doing a click through prototype to just make sure that the flow works. I, I think that's where us researchers have to start thinking about where we draw the line. Where Where is the research in terms of um, the impact and, and how widespread it is versus gut checking cert certain things within the products we're designing. Sure, I teach a, a, a UX strategy workshop and I have something called Brian's Law. I'm Brian, Paul Brian. Um, and it's that the rigor that's put into the design process and the research process should be proportional to the risk and the reward that's coming out the other side. And I, I kind of hear you saying something similar that uh, when the scope is really large and when the impact is really large, uh, that it's very important that the research is done correctly. Whereas if the impact is smaller or if there's the scope is smaller, um, then people testing their own products makes sense. Am I hearing that correctly? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think it's unrealistic for us as researchers to say no one else can talk to users. That's not what we want. We want everybody to be user centric and really be thinking about the people we're designing and creating for. But the reality is, is that we're also scientists and we've been trained either on the job or through schooling or through schooling and on the job, how to make sure that our research is valid and reliable through statistical measures, through unbiased questioning, through cross um, comparisons. And I, that, that's where I think like the scope, like you said, comes in, where we have to be realistic about um, the, the skill set that comes into that. It's not necessarily something that can be taught in an hour workshop. Um, and I think one of the big things that I've heard in my career, you know, inside and outside the profession in general, is like anybody can talk to somebody, like anybody can do an interview. And I, that that kind of view and that kind of thought process I, devalues the the training and the time and the work that we've done to get to a place where we can provide very sound, very directional data for our our teams and for our companies to make very big strategic decisions or you know pivots or whatever it is that they need to make it's not gut checks it's it's based on solid directional information sure well i'm not going to name any names but uh, along the way i've seen some rather spectacular failures uh, of products from companies that i would think have all the resources in the world and and yet the product doesn't find its fit and it doesn't find its market and um, and and fails over time and very expensive failures as well um, and I, I wondered when I saw that about the research you know what what led them to believe that this was actually what was needed and was going to fit versus you know it, it's a great product and it was produced very well but it, it's not something that actually people are going to pick up and use every day yeah, I think um, one of the big issues that we face as researchers is that even at big companies, we find that we are under-resourced and that under-resourcing can lead to these big um, uh, problems that you mentioned when there is one or two researchers on a team that, you know, has, you know, double digit des designers and engineers and PMs were expected to, to do a lot and to do everything. And that's not realistic. One of the things we have to, to really think about as researchers is where we say no and where we say yes and what we prioritize. Um, because unfortunately, research is often one of the least resourced areas at a company. Yeah, I mean, a long time ago, um, someone said that you can test your software with five people and find 80% of the problems with it. I think that was kind of a simpler world where the big problems were real obvious and where they were going to get stumbled over by as soon as people started using the products. It seems like those times have changed. And yet this idea kind of remains that, you know, if we get out of the building and we kind of, you know, get a few tests going, that we somehow have a representative view of what's gonna happen when we push it out to the larger world. 
And somehow I only hear that in design. You know, you don't hear that in pharmaceuticals. You don't hear that in like stadium building or, you know, or airplanes or anything. Nobody says talking to a few people is going to get you the right answer. But somehow in design, it's just a urban legend. Yeah, absolutely. And I, especially in the area that I work in, which is education, it's so important to be in the space that the tool is being used, which, you know, being in the pandemic poses its own problems and, and learning, figuring out ways to be in that space, right? Um, because there's so many variables that come into play um, that you can't replicate in a, um, like a lab or in a cafe study or, you know, grabbing someone who's passing by to do a flow. You have teachers, you have students, you have noise, you have um, stress, you have the bell, you have like, there are so many variables to take into consideration. And being in the classroom and testing our products is a super important, but it's also important to think like five people is not going to be enough to really understand where or how our product is landing and how it's being used. You have to be more broad. For example, like we need to think of how certain classrooms are different than others. When you think about socioeconomic status or access to technology, all of these things play huge, are huge factors in how the tech is used. And so just testing it with five people, like you said, doesn't work um, necessarily in getting the depth that you need in your research. You need to be more broad. And one of the things as you know, a, a researcher, our, our job is to figure out how broad we need to be, what, what ways we have to recruit, who we have to recruit, and how do we balance it, and what can we say from the data we glean. Um, testing something in one classroom does not mean that I can apply all of those findings to every classroom around the globe. It's very opposite. It's just a tiny drop in the bucket. And so I think it's, it's really important for us to be able to, to speak to these things and provide balance. And also when we talk to our stakeholders, remind them what we, were, what we looked at and who we can apply this to. And one of the things I think that trained researchers um, have a lot more experience with is segmentation. So in the classrooms that you mentioned, I imagine there are a number of different learning styles that have to be accommodated. Whereas if I'm looking mainly for usability issues or kind of, you know, interactions that don't quite work right, I'm not really seeing necessarily the type of segmentation, a product at that level with that many people using it at that, you know, level of importance as well, that without that understanding of segmentation, I think the, the results are not going to be um, guiding us to where we should go with the product. What's your thought about that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the things I did when I first came on to the education team, I was focused on higher education before I focused more broadly on K-12 and higher ed. And it was very clear that we needed to understand the different segments, the different segments of students, the different segments of educators and admins. And so I dived into a large segmentation study where we were able to pull apart all of these different players and then the subgroups that play into to each of those user groups like every it's funny because when you talk about education people just say students but when you think of higher ed students how big is that population i mean it's like everybody between the ages of 18 and in 24 25 right and they come from all different backgrounds they have all different kinds of needs they have different goals um so my my whole push to use segments is to understand what those segments were within each user group. And from there, I use that as a guide to my usability recruitment, right? So if our goal is to create a better grading workflow, we need to think about the teachers and the segments who actually do heavy online grading, right? So picking out, you know, literacy professors with high, um, tech ability, they're going to be heavy users of our tool. But we also don't want just the heavy users. We want the ones who are going to struggle as well. So we pick out those literacy professors who are being forced to think about being forced to use their LMS because of mandated um, rules and regulations at their university who are very low tech savvy. So it's really bringing in, to get, bringing in all of those variables to be able to select the right group of recruitment to do our usability test because 
it, it, it really needs to work across the board. Yeah, so I guess a couple of the issues that we've talked about so far are representativeness of the findings, and the other one is segmentation, or really just the knowledge of how research works and, and how to guide products based on that research. But the fact is, like you said, that resources are scarce, and it seems that people are gonna do their own research. So I've talked to a few people, and they have a couple of solutions I wanted to get your take on. One solution um, is that the researchers proactively create a program um, that uh, then trains certain people in a limited scope. And that way they're kind of like authorized research uh, uh, leaders. The other approach seems to be to take the traditional um, view of user research as either being generative or formative or evaluative and kind of push people toward the evaluative stage because they're really impacting the overall product less. They're just kind of refining it. Do either of those seem right to you or is there some other method that you would like to institute uh, to, to ensure quality results? Yeah, I mean, the reality is we're under-resourced. <laughs> you can never have as many researchers as you need for the amount of questions you get from your stakeholders um, without, you know, learning how to say no to, to a lot of requests. And the reality is we're going to need to work with other people. And I always bring in my design team, my engineers and my PM when I have, when I'm doing any type of research that touches on their product, plain and simple, they see the research guide. They're part of the research question formation. They come into the studies often to take notes. So they're absorbing what I'm what I'm doing and what they're seeing so they can actually speak to the user and sometimes they're even proud of the part of the data processing so when I'm going through and doing data analysis for any kind of usability study my designer also um, you know comes in and, and says what they thought they saw and we cross compare the reality like you said we're under resourced and the thing is, is that we're going to need to have extra hands. Unfortunately, it, to, to expect that researchers can train designers and engineers and PMs to do what they're doing in a very short period of time it is not realistic. We've spent years learning what we do, and this idea that we, we should train everybody to do what we do in an hour workshop um, just doesn't make sense. I think we have to be extremely selective over what we train um, our stakeholders on or our cross-functional team members on. Doing usability testing in terms of like a gut check on, you know, a user flow, like you said, something just to get uh, a quick evaluation on if we're going in the right direction. I think we can definitely create a system around that, but it takes a lot of time and effort and oversight, right? And I do think that research needs to continue to be a part of the process in that it's not just teaching someone and handing it all over. We should be at every touch point, making sure things are going well, even with the smallest studies. That makes sense. Um, well, that's uh, the topics that I had arranged for us today. Any closing thoughts for our listeners before we sign off? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is just understanding that research is more than talking to people. We're really unearthing those insights and those data points that allow for us to go further. And I think as we all begin to learn how to value each other and our roles and, and what we do, um, it allows for us to collaborate more and, and be more involved with one another. Amanda, thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.